Hey everybody, Dr. Steven here. And we got Luna. And we got Loki. And we're gonna keep talking about global warming today. Sound good, fella? Oh yeah. So the focus today is going to be about how global warming is going to affect the oceans. And uh, let's get right to it. Yeah, he's a good boy. Did I just pick you up? Gosh. Did I just pick you guys up? Are you guys... <laughs> Don't you scratch me. Don't you scratch me. I'm doing a lecture, Loki. All right. As a general reminder, global warming is this idea that the Earth is getting hotter. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane are being created by humans at a very alarming rate. And these gases trap heat on the Earth. And so far, we have covered a lot of different changes that are happening around the world. Obviously, temperatures are rising pretty quickly. We talked about how ice is melting and oceans are rising as they heat up. We've talked about how wind and rain patterns are going to shift everywhere. Some places are going to get drier, some places are going to get rainier, and um, that's going to affect what kind of plants and animals can live there, what kind of humans can live there, and what kind of farming and human activities can be done there as well. One fascinating a uh, tidbit that I left off when I was talking about wind and rain. I mentioned that um, the eastern half of the United States is getting rainier uh, and rainier, that typically it's getting uh, above average amounts of rain, 10 to 20% more. Um, one kind of interesting fact that I, I picked up on when I was studying is that back um, around 5,000 years ago, they've reconstructed pollen records of the eastern United States. And there was this region, 10B, you can see this, this spot right here that stretches from Louisiana to uh, Southern Illinois. And um, basically the length of the Mississippi River, um, Southern Mississippi River, uh, 10B is basically a swamp here. Um, so 5,000 years ago, the entirety of the Mississippi River Basin um, was a swamp <laughs> uh, because it was raining so much and so much rain um, entered the Mississippi River that basically the banks would overflow uh, enough and the water table would rise enough in this area that it was swampy. Um, currently we have some swamps here in Louisiana and maybe a couple here and there throughout Arkansas, uh, but the entire length of this region would be uh, swampified for you know many, many miles of swamp. <laughs> And um, currently, I think it's just kind of uh, ironic that as I'm recording this, we have flood warnings pretty much across the entire eastern United States. Uh, there's flood warnings across um, uh, Texas and uh, Louisiana and um, also up here uh, all along the Mississippi River. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, seems like uh, these trends are pretty consistent here. I was also uh, watching a documentary here today where in 2019, these massive floods happened all along the Mississippi um, and all this farmland was flooded and was unusable. So I think like something like 200,000 acres around the Mississippi River couldn't be planted uh, because it was flooding so much. And then the same thing happened in 2020. And uh, by the looks of it right now, the same thing might be happening in 2021. Uh, so. Um, yeah, looks pretty swampy. Uh, looks like uh, if you live in the east of the United States, you might wanna you might wanna start picking up a Cajun accent here. Start no longer farming. You gonna wanna uh, grow up some alligator and some crawdad up in the swamp there. This ain't no farmland no more. This is a swamp. Polite, polite. <laughs> Sorry, let me tug doggy out. Me tug doggy out. Okay. Uh, just have the defense run sprints. I get right there, Kalei. I ready out. Hey, ha ha! Lead off, man. Now we with that kind of fuck are we going? That way I get a boot call at my back. Anyway, uh, I apologize for the terrible Cajun accent. Uh, but by the looks of it, um, here in Houston, about here. Uh, we will be outside of the swamp zone, so uh, maybe I won't have to utilize my Cajun accent very much. 
Uh, anyway, moving on. Um, our question of the day is, um, what about the oceans? So as things heat up, how are the oceans going to change? And how or is life in the oceans going to change? Um, how are ocean currents going to change? When we discussed wind and rain, um, there were a few moments where we talked about how you know this area of the world has a really warm ocean next to it and that brings a lot of rain and evaporation to this region and we would look at another region of the world and it would have had a colder ocean next to it and that wouldn't bring as much evaporation um the reason why there's warm and cold oceans in the world is because of ocean currents basically how the water of the ocean moves and those are changing currently uh, obviously temperatures are going to be changing but differently in different places and ocean chemistry is changing uh, so all of these things are going to affect life in the ocean and they're going to have an impact on climate on land. And um, yep, yeah, those are our guiding questions of the day. So when we're talking about ocean currents, um, we actually have a few different things going on. And as usual, it's pretty complicated. Um, I actually think the best way to kind of explore what's going on with the ocean currents is actually to look at um, the uh, interactive Earth model. Um, that we looked at last uh, lecture. So let's pull that up and see if we can generalize any patterns about ocean currents um, to try to figure out exactly what is going on here. All right, so our interactive map here can also show not only how the wind is blowing in the world right now, uh, but also how the ocean is moving in the world. Different parts of the, of the ocean have these mass movements of water in certain directions, and that is what we call an ocean current. That's like a strong current of water moving in one direction. Um, so let's start here in the Pacific Ocean and see what we notice with this ocean current. So the lines indicate motion of the ocean, and generally speaking, we can see uh, there's a pretty strong stream kind of moving this way all the way across the Pacific Ocean. And then there's a whole bunch of these little like eddies. These are called countercurrents. Um, the idea is, is if water gets moving too fast in one direction, these little kind of eddies and whirlpools will kind of form in the other direction. But generally speaking, you can see most of the water is moving from east to west here in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and the question is, why is this water moving this way? We could see here where water is moving faster. And it looks like at the fastest places in the Pacific, or in the kind of greenish, um, the water is moving pretty slow, half a meter per second. That's not very fast. Uh, that's like one to two feet per second, something like that. Um, so pretty slow currents out there um, compared to some other places in the world where currents you can see are moving qu quite faster. We'll get to those later. Um, so why is this water chugging along like this in mass from east to west in the Pacific Ocean? Uh, the answer is our friend wind. If we look at how the wind is blowing in that ocean, we can see the wind is blowing from uh, the east to the west. And you can kind of imagine this. Um, if you had a, a bowl full of water and you were blowing on the surface of the water, you could make the water basically blow, uh, move in the direction that you're blowing and you would get this current moving in the direction that you're blowing. You can also imagine how the little whirlpools would spin off the side of this. And that's pretty much the exact same that's, thing that's happening in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and typically, most currents at the surface of the ocean are moving because that's how the wind is blowing them. Let's look here in the um, Atlantic Ocean here and see if the same thing holds true. Here we can see the current is swirling and moving um, in different directions. Sometimes it's going this way, sometimes that way, but the overall mass of water uh, is also moving here from the east to the west. You can see it very strongly moving that way. Let's see what the wind's doing here. Yep, it's also going east to west, so, you know, 
the the water's being blown. But you'll notice here, and by the way, the colors here represent uh, temperature of the ocean. So we can see, you know, we have a warmer ocean here, and then there's this strong warm current pushing its way up here all the way. You can see this warmer water. Blue is cold, this green and yellow and red and orange. Those are all pretty warm waters. You can see this really strong current moving across the Atlantic Ocean up towards northern Europe and into the Arctic all the way up there. And if we look at wind patterns, you can say the wind is actually blowing pretty much in the opposite direction of this current. The winds, if anything, are kind of blowing down and sweeping this way. And the current is basically moving the opposite direction. There's, I mean, this is a super fast current. If we look at the speed here, I mean, this current is boogieing compared to this other one. I mean, that's red. This current is going like three times faster than the, the ones in the Pacific Ocean. So what the heck is happening? It's just chugging, chuttering along up into the Gulf of Mexico, around Florida, moving super fast, super fast, all the way up, pushing all the way up to the Arctic Ocean. And it's actually pushing, for the most part, against the wind, and it's moving fast. This introduces the other big aspect of the ocean currents. Most ocean currents are explained by wind patterns, but there are a few that are explained by convection. And what's called the ocean conveyor belt. So this is a kind of typical wind map of the world and when we look at the ocean currents of the world you can see that for the most part it kind of lines up with the winds especially around the equator. Uh, here we see winds are blowing this way, here we see ocean currents are blowing this way, here we see winds are blowing this way and ocean currents are blowing that way. So for the most part, yeah, the winds explain a lot of how the surface of the ocean is moving, with the exception of this one region here where it seems like um, it kind of defies the, uh, the, the direction of the wind, so to speak. And that's because this is something called the ocean conveyor. Uh, this is a convection-driven ocean current, a global ocean current. So it, you can kind of think of it as like a big conveyor belt that's moving uh, along the entirety of the ocean. And it's a bit more complicated than this diagram, but this does a pretty good job of showing um, what's going on with it. The idea is up here in the Arctic, the oceans get really, really cold. Uh, remember the North Pole at the top of the world is actually an ocean, it's the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it gets so cold that the ocean freezes over pretty much all year round. It's melting fast, but um, it's super, super cold up there. And that cold water is more dense than the rest of the water in the ocean. And so it wants to sink to the bottom of the ocean. And as it's sinking to the bottom, if it's pushing down underneath the rest of the ocean, something has to fill in this gap. And so the warm water from here basically comes up to the Arctic to fill in that gap. The water, as it gets colder up here in the North Pole, it sinks to the bottom and then it goes on this long, massive pathway all the way down to Antarctica. Uh, a bit of it splits off and moves to the Indian Ocean, and a bit of it splits off and moves to the Pacific Ocean. And then this long belt comes back and connects back to the Atlantic Ocean. So this is the ocean conveyor. Uh, it's unbelievably important to the world and how it functions, and we'll get into that um, later. But first, let's talk about these um surface currents and how global warming is changing the surface currents and then we'll talk about how global warming is changing the conveyor belts and ultimately why we should care about any of this stuff the thing to understand about surface currents is actually there are certain patterns of surface currents i would say it all mainly depends on the wind and how the wind is blowing but we have what we call climate patterns that happen in the wind-driven currents of the ocean. Uh, and the most famous one is something called El Nino and La Nina. Obviously, these are Spanish words. We'll get some tildes on there. I'm not sure how to type those into the PowerPoint. Um, El Nino and La Nina 
are climate patterns associated with the surface currents of the Pacific Ocean that is altered by the winds that are blowing across the Pacific Ocean. So the winds of the Pacific Ocean actually very subtly shift from time and again. That affects the ocean currents and ultimately this affects the entire climate of the Pacific Ocean um, and around much of the rest of the world. So let's get into describing what the Pacific Ocean currents look like and then what this El Nino La Nina thing is. And then also, uh, why do we care about any of this and what does it have to do with global warming? All right, so this is a pretty typical um, year for the Pacific Ocean. This is basically what's happening. Kind of like I showed you, we have wind blowing across the Pacific Ocean from the east to the west. So the winds are starting off over by South America. Uh, just to make sure you know where you are, this is North America, there's California, this is Mexico, down to South America. The winds are blowing across the Pacific Ocean. And in the process, the water on the surface is warmed by the sun. And so you can kind of imagine if you're blowing on a bowl and the surface is warm, you're gonna kind of blow the warm water across the bowl to the other side. And that's exactly what happens uh, typically in the Pacific Ocean. The wind blow across, warm water generally pulls up over here on the Western side of the Pacific over by Indonesia and New Guinea uh, and all those islands over there. And this is a very, very rainy place in the world. And the reason it says no influence is that this is pretty typical. This is average. So something else that happens, as you can kind of imagine with this, imagine you have a bowl of water that you're blowing across and the surface is warm. And so you're blowing the warm water to the other side of the bowl. You can kind of think if you push all the water to the other side of the bowl, something kind of has to come up to fill the kind of gap that you've created, right? You've blown the water onto one side of the bowl water from the bottom of the bowl kind of has to come up to the surface to kind of fill the space that you've created by blowing the, the surface water across and that's exactly what happens and that's kind of what this bottom diagram is showing so we have the warm water pooling over here this is like a cross section so if we look at the ocean um, kind of cut it in half uh, along our trade winds line um, we can see that basically you push the warm water over to one side and then cold water actually comes bubbling up from deeper in the ocean. Uh, and that's why normally this side of the Pacific Ocean is actually cooler. Uh, the eastern side is actually cooler than the western side. And we can see this actually in the Earth model. Pacific Ocean is huge. It almost covers the entire half of the world. But we can see this side is this dark red getting pink, very warm. The other side, we have some yellows in here uh, and over here we can see on an average this is a cooler uh, over here on the eastern pacific compared to the western pacific where you have this big blob of red so that's kind of normally what's going on in the pacific ocean we have these two different other things that can happen in the pacific ocean one is called el nino and the other is called la nina I didn't name them. I'm not sure who did, but that's, that's what they're called. Um, so let's go over El Nino first. El Nino is what happens when these winds that blow across the Pacific, Pacific Ocean uh, weaken. So there are not as strong. And actually, there is even a bit of counter wind that picks up going the other direction in the Pacific Ocean. So now you can imagine that in our bowl analogy, you know, we're not blowing um, the water quite as much. And so the warm water doesn't really move to the other side of the bowl. And actually there's somebody blowing the other direction, blowing it back towards us. And exactly the same thing happens in the Pacific Ocean. So all this warm water comes sloshing back this way. This side of the Pacific Ocean is warmer than normal. And because um, nobody's blowing that warm water across, the winds aren't blowing it across, this side is cooler than normal. This is going to affect how the water evaporates. You're going to get now more evaporation on the eastern side. That's going to bring more rain over there, and you're going to bring less rain over here in Australia. 
And here's our little cross section diagram showing how the warm water is blowing back across. And the cold water is kind of suppressed. It generally stays at the bottom. All right, La Nina is the opposite. During La Nina, the winds strengthen and get really, really strong. And so blow lots and lots of warm water all over here, more and more and more of it. And it all kind of piles up over here on the western side of the Pacific Ocean. Imagine you're really blowing really, really hard on this bowl, uh, blowing all this warm water across. Because you are blowing the surface water so hard across the, the bowl and how the winds are blowing strongly across the ocean, you have this response where more of the cold water actually comes to the surface. Here's our cross section. And so we have stronger what's called upwelling uh, in this ocean. And so this portion of the Pacific Ocean gets very cold. Uh, cooler than it normally is. You can kind of infer that if all the warm water is over here on the west side, even more so than normal, it's going to be even rainier over here in Australia and New Guinea and Indonesia. And because it's colder than normal, it might get drier over on this side, the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean. Um, just to kind of introduce you to this concept, we were talking about how this cold water can come up uh, more strongly or, or be suppressed in different scenarios. And this cold water upwelling, we call it. So upwelling is when cold water is coming from the deep ocean to the surface, um, is actually really, really important to ocean life. Um, so uh, this deep water is typically very full of nutrients, uh, like all of the different nutrients that have kind of fallen and sunken down in the ocean kind of come back to the surface. And so plankton and fish and sharks and whales, all these places where you have really cold water, uh, they really have a buffet. And you have these really complex food chains um, and really, really cool aquatic environments in these areas that have upwelling. So when you think about what lives here in this part of the Pacific Ocean and down here in this part of the Pacific Ocean, we have massive great white sharks. The biggest great white shark I think uh, recorded in modern history is found uh, right here. Um, huge, huge female uh, great white shark. I'm sure I'm showing you footage of it. It's incredible. What was her, her name's like Big Blue or something like that. Um, massive female great white shark uh, was found over there. Um, same, it goes, uh, you have these ecosystems with these kelp forests and otters and seals and even some penguins and all kinds of fish and they're just really really neat ecosystems uh, in the oceans here at these locations next to where this upwelling occurs um, so you know this upwelling is very very important um, but the kind of ironic thing is that you have this rich ecosystem in the ocean but because the water is so cold and there's not much evaporation taking place there along the coast, typically you have this rich ecosystem in the ocean and then you have essentially a desert right next to it on the land, uh, typically where this upwelling happens. So right here, the um, where that coast of Mexico where you have the great white sharks, uh, Baja California and the um, west coast of Mexico, this is a desert here. Uh, this coast of South America is a super dry, massive desert. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting that you notice these patterns happening in the world that all depend on this, this ocean current dynamic. And kind of just like what I was just saying, um, the El Nino and La Nina basically have an impact uh, on how rainy it is in different places all around the Pacific Ocean. It even affects us here in the United States. Uh, typically when you have an El Nino, you have all this warm water shooting back this way, pulling up over here and that generates evaporation and so all that evaporation basically uh, causes more rainfall in these regions uh, in the pacific ocean the opposite is true of la nina if the winds are blowing even harder this way and all the warm water pools up here this is where we're going to get more of our rain and over on our side of the pacific ocean it's going to be drier you can already kind of guess what's been happening in California. Um, super mega drought here for the Southwest United States. And um, part of that is actually due to La Nina. So here's our blow up map uh, reviewing how rainfall has changed in the United States over the last uh, 30 years compared to the previous 30 years. Uh, you can see this section of 
the Southwest United States that's next to the Pacific Ocean uh, is getting way less water uh, in the last 30 years. And generally speaking, something else that happens with La Nina is we get a wetter zone here. Um, the kind of strange thing happens is that some of this warmth kind of circles back around this way, and there's some winds that kind of pick it up and blow it across over to this region. Um, so that's also happening here more and more recently. We can see that as we have this dry zone in the southwest, we have this super wet zone up here. And um, generally speaking, um, the Gulf Coast is also supposed to be getting drier with this pattern, but um, we've kind of been the uh, exception that breaks the rule here in my neck of the woods. Um, technically, the entirety of the south of the United States is supposed to get drier, uh, but it seems like the actual coast of the Pacific Ocean is affected more. And um, as far as we can tell, this Gulf Coast is uh, is getting plenty of rain lately. And like I was saying, it's ironic I'm recording this right now because <laughs> right now, May 2021, uh, this this section of the United States is getting hammered with summer thunderstorms and we have basically flood warnings across the entirety of the eastern United States. And at the same time, um, we have a massive drought that's hitting California this year again. They have, I think, only about half the rain they normally get. Um, so it's probably going to be another terrible wildfire season for this half of the United States. And it's going to be a super rainy, hurricane, floody season for the eastern half of the United States. Uh, I'm I'm getting I'm getting ready for that swamp time. Yeah, we're gonna be in a we're gonna be in a swamp here before you know it in the east. So now the big tie-in here with global warming. Um, we've analyzed the data over the last 40 years or so of El Nino and La Nina patterns, and it seems about 20 years ago there was a pretty drastic change. Uh, where we seem to be going more from El Nino to more and more La Ninas. Uh, it'll be kind of interesting to see if that trend holds um, as global warming continues. But if we look uh, since, we'll say, in the last 20 years, since the year 2000, we can actually count the number of El Nino and La Nina years. Um, by the way, this indicator here, this is the kind of El Nino La Nina strength indicator. If you're between negative, um, one and one, uh, we consider this the normal zone. So it's neither El Nino or La Nina. Um, and if you're above one here in the red, those would be years with El Nino. That's the El Nino zone. And if you are below this negative one, this is La Nina. And then when we also can measure the strength of these El Ninos and La Ninas. If you're above a two, then you're considered like a severe El Nino. And if you're uh, below a negative two, you're considered a severe La Nina event. Um, so we can look in the last 20 years and kind of count how many years we've had El Nino uh, versus La Nina versus normal. Um, so in year 2000, we were in La Nina. So we had one year of La Nina. In the next year, 2001, you can see we were right on the edge of having being uh, La Nina, but technically we were normal. Uh, and then we were normal for quite some time. Um, almost got to an El Nino, but not quite. Uh, normal, normal, normal within the normal range. And then here we go. In 2007 and eight, we had uh, La Nina. So that's our second one. In 2009, we had another La Nina. That's our third one. And then finally, in 2010, we had our first El Nino. By 2011, it switched back to a severe La Nina. That's our fourth one, fourth year of that. Um, in 2011, we were still in the La Nina. That's five years of La Nina. Uh, 2012, again, we're still in La Nina. That's six La Ninas. Uh, then it went back to normal for a year. But then once again here, we had another La Nina event. Um, not as strong, but nonetheless, we did. Finally, 2015 and 16, we had an El Nino event. That's our second one. It was a severe one. And then a couple of years of normal. 
2018 La Nina. It's our eighth one. And then 2020 was La Nina. And then 2021 is La Nina too. So you can see in the last 20 years, we've had 10 years of La Nina and only two years of El Nino. If you look at the 20 years before that, uh, you can see actually we had more El Nino than La Nina, but it was much more balanced. So it seems like the shift is shifting towards La Nina. And again, La Nina is the pattern that brings super dry conditions to the west coast of the United States and generally rainier conditions up to the um, east coast and uh, in particular the northeast coast and the midwest and so you know it's not too shocking that in this last um, you know 30 year period that we're seeing this pattern of rainfall in the United States it has a lot to do with this wind current in the United States and how the oceans are moving basically but back in the year in the 90s in the 2000s early 2000s um, you know, people could have been saying the opposite with global warming, where we were saying there's more El Ninos uh, instead. And um, the real answer is we don't really know if if we're going to get more persistent La Ninos or El Ninos. Um, I was trying to read a little bit about um, paleoclimatology data, the, the history of Earth's past climate, and looking at that period of time, uh, between three and 8,000 years ago where the earth was persistently warmer. And um, there is a lot of discussion about it, but I did find some articles that said that uh, back then, earth may have been in a more permanent La Nina-like state uh, to the present climate. So um, there does seem to be some evidence that as you heat up the planet, La Nina could get more frequent. To me, this kind of makes sense. Um, we're looking at these winds blowing across the Pacific Ocean, and we're kind of only looking at it at from the surface perspective. Uh, but these winds are actually blowing <clears throat> in a massive convection loop where these winds are blowing across, but they are part of a convection loop that is rising, cooling off, dumping off rain, and then returning back. Um, so if you add more heat to this system, it makes sense to me that these winds would pick up speed across and this loop would actually uh, accelerate. If the winds are picking up speed, that's La Nina. And so I could see logically as we heat up the system more and more, we actually end up pushing Earth more and more towards a La Nina state. I would say this is kind of good news. Um, La Nina tends to, as this warm wind is pushing across, it's actually pushing into the surface of the ocean. And so the hot air from the wind is actually being forced into the ocean. And uh, the ocean is absorbing a whole bunch of the heat uh, that is being caused by global warming. And so the oceans are getting hotter, but we living on land, it's actually kind of a, has a cooling effect. Um, on a lot of areas of the world. Um, but of course, there are issues. Um, California getting drier and drier and drier, for example, is not really a good thing. Um, something else to think about is that this ocean over here that's getting warmer, um, as all this warm water is being blown across and as the warm air is kind of blowing against the water and mixing with the water and heating up the water, um, there are lots of coral reefs that live in this region of the world, in the South Pacific. And as those waters are heating up more and more, the coral reefs are actually dying. It's called coral bleaching. Uh, basically, these reefs can only handle so much stress. And as you ride, increase the temperatures, um, the coral reef will die. Um, so a lot of these really unbelievably cool ecosystems over here in the South Pacific, as these waters are getting warmer and warmer, are actually dying off. When the opposite happens in the El Nino and all the warm water pulls up over here, obviously the reefs on this side of the ocean can die as well. So kind of regardless um, whether global warming is bringing extreme El Ninos or extreme La Ninas or more persistent one way or the other, uh, it's going to have an effect on life.
There are also kind of El Nino, La Nina situations in the other oceans of the world. There's something called the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is basically the Indian Ocean La Nina. So the idea is that now we've shifted over to the Indian Ocean. And when you have really, really strong winds in the Indian Ocean pushing across, basically you have warmer than normal water over here on the western side, kind of like the same as, as La Nina for the Pacific Ocean. And that brings more rain over here to Africa and to the Arabian Peninsula. And remember, as it rains more and more over here, uh, that's where we get all the locusts and stuff from, uh, which has been happening uh, in recent years and we get more hurricanes up into this region. Uh, and then the opposite happens over here in Australia. We actually get drier uh, conditions over here because all the warm water was pushed away and all the rainfall was pushed away. Then we also have something called the Indian Ocean negative phase dipole, which is kind of like the El Nino of the Pacific Ocean. Again, the winds blow the other way and all the warm water pools over here uh, by um, the South Pacific and uh, Australia. And that brings rain this way and drought over uh, over in the uh, Africa and Arabian Peninsula. You might have heard about the massive fires that happened in Australia in 2019 and 2020 um, during that summer. And it just so happens that that corresponded to a extreme positive Indian dipole. And again, the extreme positive is when all the warm water is blown away from Australia and it gets really, really dry there. Uh, so um, those fires were caused less by El Nino or La Nina and more by this Indian Ocean version of that event. When we look at this chart showing the, again, this is the positive uh, Indian Ocean dipole here, um, kind of looks like similar to our El Nino or La Nina chart. Uh, anything up in this region is the positive dipole. Anything down here is going to be the negative dipole. And if we look in the last 20 years, we can see um, one, two, three, four, five of the positive dipoles and only one, two of the negative dipoles, which means that seemingly the trend uh, here as the planet is warming is that we are getting potentially more of the Indian Ocean dipoles, which the positive dipole is kind of like the La Nina of the Indian Ocean. So just like we're getting more La Ninas in the Pacific Ocean, we're kind of getting more of the kind of La Ninas of the Indian Ocean as well. Um, I really wish they renamed the Indian Ocean positive dipole to like Indian Ocean La Nina, just to make it less confusing. But it's basically the same thing. The winds are blowing across and blowing the warm water over here. You know, it kind of begs the question if what if we have a La Nina in an Indian Ocean dipole at the same time? So you have warm water pooling up here, but then it's blowing even across. Does it kind of balance out or does it just continue piling up over there? Uh, yeah, these different ocean um, climate events do kind of play off of each other. What happened to Australia actually in 2019 and 2020 is we had a mild El Nino event, barely qualifying as an El Nino. During El Nino in the Pacific Ocean, um, winds push rain away from Australia. So we have a reduced chance of rain for Australia during El Nino. So that was happening in 2019, 2020. In the Indian Ocean, we had the opposite. We had a positive phase. So all the water was blowing this way. So effectively, Australia was being dried out on both ends of it. And so it's not too surprising that 2019, 2020 was just like an insane wildfire season for Australia. Uh, which was made much worse by the fact that everything is hotter as well. Um, so, yeah, the towering infernos that you saw coming out of Australia that year were really uh, a result of this really bad uh, outcome. And there's even an at, what's called the Atlantic Nino and Nina, where there's, uh, again, same kind of idea. Uh, winds can either be blowing hard this way and cooling off the Atlantic, um, ocean near Africa, or the winds can kind of be blowing back the warm water here. And generally speaking, this doesn't affect us too much in the United States. It's, it seems to have a bigger effect on this region of Africa in terms of rainfall. So just to kind of summarize all that, um, what we're seeing in the world is that 
we have these different climate patterns in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, and they're all determined by how the wind is blowing and how the ocean currents are flowing at the surface. Uh, generally speaking, it seems like the east to west strength in these oceans is increasing, um, both with the Pacific Ocean with the La Nina and also the Indian Ocean with the positive dipole. So in other words, so far in the last 20 years, and again, we don't really know if this trend will hold, but the, the winds are picking up speed, blowing that way and blowing this way, which is bringing water here and bringing water here. And it's drying out the regions of this area and this area because cold water is coming there and it's also drying out this area. So a lot of these patterns that we were talking about with rainfall happening um, really do boil down to these climate patterns of the oceans and the ocean currents and how the winds influence that. One thing that we definitely know is regardless of whether or not La Nina and the positive dipole are picking up uh, is that pretty much all these weather trends are amplified amplified by rising temperatures. So if you have a drought where you have less rainfall, you know, that can be pretty bad, but it's made much worse if temperatures get really hot. Uh, if you're a tree and there's a drought and you don't have water, you know, that sucks for you as a tree, but if it's really, really hot outside too, then that sucks even more because you're drying out even further. Um, so the same can kind of be said of flooding events. So if you have a lot of warm water shifting towards you because it's, uh, for whatever reason, El Nino or La Nina, um, if that water is getting really, really hot because global warming, uh, that's gonna bring more flooding, more rainfall, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so generally speaking, all of this stuff is kind of getting amplified by global warming and seemingly we're also getting more of the La Ninas and positive Indian dipoles. And that brings us to kind of this last thing that we're going to talk about here, uh, which is the ocean conveyor. Uh, that's this other really big ocean current that's being driven by convection. So just as a refresher here, the idea is that up here at the Arctic Ocean, this is the North Pole here in the center of our map. This is a super, super cold ocean, the coldest ocean in the world, um, much colder than the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Indian Oceans. Um, the North Pole up here is actually water, uh, but usually this ocean is so cold that it is frozen. Uh, and so we have just sea ice floating on top of this ocean. Because this ocean is so cold, it's also really, really heavy. Uh, cold substances are contract and are more heavy than hot substances. So this cold, heavy water wants to sink down. It wants to sink to the bottom of the ocean. And as it's pushing down underneath this ocean, um, in the process of it pushing down underneath, warm water is brought up to kind of fill the gap. And so up here we have this convection current where we have warm water from the south moving up to fill the gap. As it moves up here, it gets cold and heavy and it sinks back down, which brings more warm water and that then gets cold and heavy and it sinks back down. And so we have this nice convection loop up here at the North Pole. This convection loop, it happens right here where the warm water is coming up this way. It's getting cold and it's sinking back down to the bottom of the ocean right there. Once it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean, it actually travels really, really, really far around the world, all the way back down to Antarctica, all the way around. And there's a couple spots that it comes up in the world. Um, the water kind of just randomly will come up back to the surface here in the Indian Ocean and over here in the Pacific Ocean. The overall effect that this has on the world is massive because we have a net motion of warm water coming up this way from the Atlantic Ocean up to Northern Europe and to the Arctic Ocean. And then we have this cold water that's coming from the bottom of the ocean back up to the surface over here in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And the overall effect that this has on the climate of the world is that this region up here is generally warmer than it should be otherwise because all this warm water is coming up to it and heating it up. And generally speaking, we can say the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean 
are actually cooler than they would be without this con convection current. So the convection current is actually super important in maintaining um, the temperatures of planet Earth. And we can actually look at this current in our Earth model here. Um, here is, if I zoom in on this, you can see that there is this water current that's kind of moving this way and then very, very strongly this warm water punches up all the way up here to Europe. And you can see how much warmer it is over here than it is over here on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Because all that warm water is being dumped up into Europe and some of it trickles all the way up here to the North Pole where it gets cold. As it gets colder and colder and colder, it wants to sink down and it comes back down and a lot of it sinks down underneath this warm water current. You can kind of see this cold water here. This current kind of disappears. Some of it's mixing, but a lot of it's actually sinking down underneath this current. And unfortunately, in this view, I can't show you the different layers of the ocean. This is just the surface currents of the ocean. Overall, this has a really big effect also on the climate. So we can switch over to air temperatures and let's see how the air temperatures over here in Europe compare to, say, over here in Canada. Yeah, if we go back to the wintertime, uh, this is just a random day in February that I picked. Uh, you can see this warm water current pushing up. You can see Europe is 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 pretty nice and warm over here. Uh, if we go over to the equivalent of Canada next to the colder ocean, you can see how much colder Canada is compared to Europe. And a lot of that is because of the ocean current that's coming up this way. So yeah, um, that kind of summarizes it. Um, this probably map will kind of let you see it right here where this warm water current is moving up. It's having a big warming effect on this region. And where these cold water currents are coming up is having cooling effects on kind of this whole region of the world. So in other words, if you shut this current off, the part, this part of Europe would actually get colder and um, the Indian and Pacific Ocean would actually get warmer. So how is global warming affecting this current? This current is actually being affected not so much by the heat of global warming, but by the melting of ice and the freshwater influx into this Arctic Ocean. Uh, so we've learned already that the ice uh, up here in Greenland, so just kind of, again, this is the North Pole. This is Greenland, and there's this massive ice sheet on Greenland. And as the Earth is heating up more and more, this ice sheet is melting. And so all this meltwater coming off this ice sheet is moving into the Arctic Ocean, into the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, fresh water is actually much lighter, so it's less dense than salt water. And again, this ice sheet is all made of snowpack, basically. Uh, snow that fell here that just never melted. And so as it's melting, this is actually all fresh water. It's not salty. People are kind of amazed, like, oh, so you could actually eat the glaciers in Greenland? And yeah, oh yeah, you could eat, uh, you could drink that glacier water. Um, and lots of it is running off. You basically have all these new rivers forming up there in the uh, Greenland ice sheet, just massive waterfalls of, of water jetting off of this ice sheet into the ocean. And then, of course, the ice sheet itself, as it hits the ocean, is just kind of like falling apart and falling into the ocean. And so you have all these like chunks of icebergs and stuff falling into the ocean that are melting. And yes, all this massive amount of fresh water is being dumped in the ocean. OK, so it's kind of weird. And probably the best way to draw it is that, generally speaking, we say um, warm water kind of rises and cold water sinks. That's our normal convection current. And that's, tip that's what was happening up here at the Arctic. But now we're adding this new dynamic to the system where we have fresh water and fresh water is lighter. And so fresh water is actually going to want to rise and salt water is gonna to wanna to sink. So how does that affect our dynamic that is normally going on? So typically we have warm water coming up from the south, making up to the, the ocean up here, up where it gets really, really cold. And as it gets really, really cold, it wants to sink back down to the bottom of the ocean. However, 
now, as it's coming up to the, the North Pole, it's getting mixed in with all this fresh water that's coming off the glaciers. And the fresh water does not want to sink, it wants to rise. So, in other words, the cold water up here in the Arctic Ocean wants to sink, but the fresh water wants to rise. And the net effect of this is that the convection current is weakening and kind of slowing down and shutting down. The cold water is no longer sinking because it's becoming more fresh. So it's preventing convection. And the huge question mark here is how is that going to affect planet Earth? So far, when we look at global warming patterns on planet Earth and where temperatures are rising the fastest, we see that the Arctic Ocean is getting very, very hot, and so is Europe. So this is warming much faster than the rest of the world. And pretty much all of that has been on the back of the ocean conveyor belt. In other words, as the planet is getting warmer, a huge amount of that heat is being absorbed by the oceans, and most of that heat is being pumped up to the Arctic by the conveyor belt. However, what we were just saying is that the conveyor belt is slowing down. Uh, it's actually the slowest it's been in hundreds, if not thousands of years already. And if that heat transfer is slowed down, we will no longer see this pattern where the Arctic is, is warming up faster than the rest of the world and the rest of the world will likely catch up. So in other words, instead of seeing all the heat concentrated up here at the North Pole, what we're gonna see is a more balanced warming of planet Earth. So if you think it's already getting hot in Houston, we haven't really seen much yet. Here in Houston, the warming so far has actually been pretty mild. And the reason for that is that most of the heat has been shipped up to the North Pole based off the conveyor belt. If the conveyor belt stops, this heat is no longer going to move north. It's going to stay here with us, and the pattern of warming is going to be, you know, a big mass of heat right here. That's where all the hurricanes form. That's where lots and lots of people in the world live. I mean, everybody, not many people live up here in the North Pole where it's actually heating really fast. If we see more balanced planetary warming, that's going to bring a lot more changes to everywhere else. Um, and the last point I want to make today is that also less carbon dioxide is going to be absorbed by the ocean. Um, the ocean actually, again, carbon dioxide is the pollution that we are creating when we burn any kind of fuel in our cars, in our power plants, in our industrial activities. Um, that is carbon dioxide. That's actually what's causing global warming. A large chunk of carbon dioxide is actually absorbed by the oceans. Um, so the problem would be much worse if oceans were not absorbing carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is actually dissolving into the water. What the conveyor belt does is that all this water as it's coming through the Atlantic Ocean is absorbing CO2 like crazy. And then it gets to the Arctic Ocean and normally it would get very cold and sink down to the bottom of the ocean. And all that CO2 that was absorbed would sink to the bottom of the ocean, potentially for thousands of years. And so actually, the ocean conveyor belt has been cleaning up our mess um, for decades now, for hundreds of years now, actually. And if the conveyor belt stops, it's going to stop cleaning up our mess. And there's going to be even more carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere. And more carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere it means even more warming. Um, and another random caveat is that if carbon dioxide can't sink to the bottom of the ocean, it's going to build up here in the top of the ocean. And when carbon dioxide dissolves into water, it makes something called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is pretty harmful to most ocean life. Uh, so it will actually dissolve seashells and dissolve coral reefs. Um, so again, the conveyor belt that's distributing all this heat up to the Arctic and keeping us cool is also absorbing all of our pollution and sinking it to the bottom of the ocean where it can't do much harm. Um, and if it stops, we're going to have more CO2 build up in the atmosphere. We're going to have more heat building up and actually we're going to have more toxic oceans. Uh, so 
it's in our best interest to keep this uh, conveyor belt moving. But again, all the ice that's melting off Greenland is slowing down and stopping it. All right, so that was a lot of information and uh, so much so that I actually finished the recording here at school uh, the next day, didn't even finish um, at home. Uh, so just to kind of summarize everything that we had learned there, we have these global ocean currents. Uh, some of them are determined by how the wind is blowing. So when the wind blows across the water, it kind of pushes the water in one direction. Some of it is determined by what's called the ocean conveyor belt, this big massive convection current happening in the oceans. And both of them are really, really important to our lives as humans, as well as life for everything else on planet Earth. Um, we are seeing certain kinds of ocean currents emerging and becoming more frequent, and certain kinds of wind currents emerging and becoming more frequent. Uh, those happen to be the ones where the winds around the equator are getting stronger and pushing ocean water, hot ocean water, more in one direction. Um, so La Nina, the Indian positive dipole. Some of the weather patterns that we're seeing, like more rainfall in the Sahara Desert and the Arabian Peninsula have to do with these uh, ocean currents and wind currents. And that also explains a lot of why California is getting so dry. Um, and we'll see if those patterns hold as global warming gets worse. Kind of even more alarming is that global warming is melting ice that's dumping fresh water into the Arctic Ocean. And that fresh water is preventing the cold water from sinking and driving this entire ocean conveyor belt. The impacts of this are going to be potentially massive uh, in that heat is no longer going to be moved as effectively out of the equator. So we're going to see more warming at the equator if this thing slows down. And also the amount of pollution that the ocean can actually absorb for us is going to be uh, reduced. Um, when you learn and study all this stuff, you're kind of overwhelmed with the complexity of how all this wind and water is moving and how it affects everything on Earth. And what it keeps making me think of is, man, I wish we hadn't started all this up, <laughs> basically. Um, we had a pretty good thing going for us on Earth, um, and humans had a pretty stable climate that we had been living in for a long time, thousands of years. And it probably would have been pretty stable for many, many thousand more years uh, until we eventually would have gone into another ice age. Um, but now the changes are happening so unimaginably fast that like, you, it's so complicated, you really can't tell what's going to happen with it, other than that it's going to be crazy and bad. Um, So that will kind of bring us to our very final YouTube lecture, uh, which is going to be about, hey, is there anything that we can do uh, to stop all this bad stuff from happening and to kind of get back to a more reliable and regular climate system on Earth? Uh, and that, that's, what, uh, that's what I'll talk to you about next time in our final video of the year. Anyway, have a good one. See you later. We live up by another day. We live up by another day. Yes. Why, man?